This is a Scream Queen production. I'm Jen Carpenter, and this is So Dead Podcast. Greetings, Earthlings. Or should I say, surprise, bitches. Welcome to the back half of So Dead Season 2. Normally, I would have made some sort of announcement that new episodes were coming, but I kind of made a last-minute decision to stick to my original schedule rather than put things off like I really should have done because, well, I missed you guys, and I missed talking true crime. Happy True Crime Tuesday. We are officially on day 11 billion of quarantine. How's everyone holding up? Are you guys rocking mask-shaped tan lines yet? I had the hardest time getting used to wearing a mask. I've got anxiety. I feel like I've got like a little bit of claustrophobia. I can't wear like turtlenecks. I rarely wear coats and we live in Michigan, but I don't like long sleeves. I don't wear hoodies. The necks are too, like I just, I have a thing with clothes. Loose, free, comfy, easy breezy. I was the little girl that never wore dresses because tights were too itchy. I still rip the tags out of the backs of my shirts. Just, you know, it's, it's a whole thing. So to get used to wearing something on my face like that, not easy. But I'm doing it for you and for me, for all of us. Um, all right, so we've got a lot to talk about today. But I'm going to save that for the end of the show, as always. I know it's been a while, so let's jump right in. Today, I'm going to tell you guys about Michigan's only death row inmate, serial killer Marvin Charles Gabriel II. This one's actually been on my list for a long time, and it's also probably one that people request for me to cover the most. So um, it's just, it's a rough one. So I had a hard time with it, but here we are. Cedar Springs is a small town of about 3,500 residents located 20 miles north of Grand Rapids on Michigan's west side. It is home to the Red Flannel Festival, a celebration of red flannel, obviously. Uh, Most specifically, red and black plain, nope, oh, here we go already. Uh, more specifically, red and black plaid flannel pajamas with like the drop seat at the butt with the buttons. I think I've only actually seen those in cartoons, but apparently they're a real thing. Um, I have to think that the festival's probably evolved over the years to incorporate other types of red flannel as well. But I really hope not, because that would be hilarious to see an entire town full of people in red plaid pajamas that have asses that unbutton. Just, you know, the visual is something. Um, In the 1990s, Cedar Springs was also home to a young woman by the name of Rachel Timmerman. Rachel was born to Tim and Velda Timmerman on April 6, 1978, the second of five children. Rachel's upbringing was pretty rough. When she was five, she was molested by a babysitter. She told her parents, who called the police, but charges were never filed. Her baby sister, Rebecca, died of SIDS as an infant, and her youngest brother, John, was born severely disabled. And then in 1988, her parents divorced. Velda kept the kids, and she wound up living with them at a campsite out at Gun Lake. Four little kids living at a campsite on the lake. I can't even listen. My kids are not little. They are all older. And camping for a weekend is a whole ordeal with us. I couldn't imagine living on a campsite. And the kid's dad couldn't imagine it either. So understandably, Tim wasn't having that. He wasn't having his kids live on a lake in a tent. So he took them and he moved in with a family member. After Tim took the kids, Velda moved out west to stay with some of her family for a few months. And when she returned to Michigan, a custody battle ensued. Uh, So things were pretty contentious for quite a while. But after about a year, things calmed down. 
Rachel's dad, Tim, got married again, and she got along well with her new stepmom, Lynn. She liked her mom's new boyfriend. Everyone settled into a new life, and things were peaceful for a bit. And then in the fall of 1995, when Rachel was just 17, she found herself pregnant by a boy that she'd only been seeing for a few months. Now, his name was not easy to find, and I always take that as a sign that someone doesn't want to be found, so I'm not going to share that here. Uh, The relationship wasn't serious. Rachel was in no hurry to get married. This guy was a good kid, but Rachel was not in love with him, and she didn't want to marry someone she wasn't in love with just because they were having a baby together. Good call. When she was seven months pregnant, Rachel was arrested for possession of marijuana. She told police it had been given to her by a friend and that she had no intention of smoking it or selling it, but this was the 90s and that didn't matter. She was arrested and she spent five days in jail before she even saw a lawyer. Initially, Rachel was facing several months in jail, but the courts took pity on the pregnant teenager with an otherwise spotless record and they sentenced her to probation instead. On June 15, 1996, 18-year-old Rachel gave birth to a beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby girl that she named Shannon Dale Verhaeg. In the following weeks, she got a part-time job at a local restaurant. Her parents took turns watching the baby while she was at work, and she was really just trying to get her life together, be a good mom, finish her probation. But a good life was not in the cards for Rachel Timmerman, unfortunately. On August 6, 1996, so 24 years ago this week, Rachel convinced her sister Sarah to babysit six-week-old Shannon so that she could go enjoy a night out. She'd really been doing nothing but staying home with the baby. She was getting a little stir-crazy. And family friend Wayne Davis, who was a disabled war veteran with PTSD, who was in his 40s, more than twice Rachel's age, he invited her to play cards. She wanted to get up out of the house, probably away from a crying baby for a little bit. So around 9 p.m. that night, after she'd put Shannon to sleep, Rachel walked the mile to the trailer where this card game was being held. The 18-year-old new mother was the only female in a trailer full of drunk, rowdy men, including 42-year-old Marvin Charles Gabrian II and his teenage nephew, Mikey. The elder Gabrian was instantly taken by Rachel, a pretty young blonde with an infectious smile. But he made her hella uncomfortable, and as the night went on, he became downright dangerous. The more he drank, the more aggressive he got, and at one point he grabbed Rachel's friend Wayne by the throat and started choking him. So Rachel and Wayne decided to leave, and they began to walk home. But Marvin followed them outside, and he offered them a ride. It was late, they'd all been drinking, it was August, so it was hot, it was muggy, they were out in the country, so there were mosquitoes and bugs, Uh, just not a good, not a good time to do a mile long walk. So Rachel ignored her intuition about Marvin and she accepted the ride. In the early morning hours of August 7th, Marvin and Mikey Gabrian, Wayne Davis, and Rachel Timmerman climbed into Marvin's car headed for the trailer Rachel lived in with her mom, daughter, and siblings. But Marvin didn't take Rachel home. He drove past her mother's house, out onto a dark country road. He pulled over and forced Wayne Davis and his nephew Mikey out of the vehicle, then sped off into the night with a terrified Rachel. Eventually, he pulled over again, and he forced Rachel out of the car, walked her out into the woods where he assaulted her and raped her several times. She tried to fight at first, but he was bigger and much stronger. He slammed her head into the ground and bit her nose so hard that he drew blood. So she stopped fighting and went into survival mode. She knew that Marvin could easily murder her out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night and that he had more reason to kill her than to let her live. So She somehow convinced him that she wasn't mad at him for hurting her and that she liked what he was doing to her. He told her that if she told anyone what happened, he would kill her daughter in front of her and then kill her. She promised him that she wouldn't tell, so he agreed to take her home. Marvin pulled into Rachel's mother's driveway a little after 3 a.m. 
His nephew and Wayne were inside with Rachel's family. They'd walked there after Marvin forced them out of the car. Bloodied and bruised, Rachel ran into the trailer, locked herself in the bathroom, and armed herself with a hammer. Marvin followed her inside. He figured out he'd been fooled. And Wayne and Mikey were able to get him out of the house without further incident. Rachel confided in her mother and sister about what happened, and they urged her to call the police. She was afraid. She didn't want to do it. She believed Marvin that he was going to kill her daughter and kill her, but they convinced her to call the police. And so the next morning, she went to the local hospital where they did a rape kit and treated her injuries. A warrant was issued for the arrest of Marvin Gabrion, but he was nowhere to be found. And you might be surprised to hear this, but avenging the rape of a teenage mother from the local trailer park who was on probation for drug charges wasn't high on police's list of priorities. Not because it shouldn't have been, but because it just wasn't. You know who was arrested, though? Rachel Timmerman. An anonymous tip was called in that she was drinking and partying, and she was picked up on a probation violation. Rachel reported to the Nuevo County Jail on January 11, 1997. Nine days later, Marvin Gabrion was arrested for her rape and taken to the same fucking jail. Gabrion's parents posted his $40,000 bail, and he was released on February 3rd. Meanwhile, the teenage girl he brutally raped spent the next five months behind bars. Why? Because justice. That's why. I want to take a minute here before things get really crazy to tell you a bit about Marvin Charles Gabriel II. Marvin was born to Marvin I and Elaine Gabriel on October 18, 1953, the fifth of six children. The Gabriels were dirt poor, and I do mean dirt. They lived in a small cabin built by Marvin Sr. that only had two bedrooms, which meant that all six kids shared one room, The kids wore rags and tattered shoes and were always dirty, so they were teased and bullied at school. The parents were abusive, alcoholic, drug addicts. Elaine even supplied her children with drugs. Eventually, the family moved to White Cloud. If that sounds familiar, it's because that's where the Dudgeons lived. Remember the Dudgeons from the Dudgeon Swamp Murders covered earlier this year? The Gabrians actually sound pretty Dudgeony, which is weird considering how many decades there were between their respective crimes. Despite his family being awful, Marvin Jr. was said to be a quiet kid that looked out for others who were being bullied. He had an IQ of 121, which put him in the superior range, so that's pretty good. He played basketball and football and he ran track, but after he graduated from high school, things quickly went downhill. If there's one thing a whole lot of violent criminals have in common, it's head injuries. And Marvin didn't just suffer from one head injury, he suffered from several. He was involved in several serious car and motorcycle accidents, and he went headfirst through a windshield on more than one occasion. He was struck in the head with a baseball bat during a fight and hit in the head with a blunt object during a carjacking. Fourteen documented head injuries in total. Fourteen. Marvin got in trouble with the law, lots of DUIs, robberies, assaults, and he eventually moved out of Michigan. He traveled the country for a few years before returning home to White Cloud in 1979. His family, shitty as they were, noticed a change in him. He was violent, paranoid, a heavy drinker. He made his money by running scams. Uh, He was diagnosed with bipolar, and he spent time in and out of homeless shelters. He was actually often kicked out of shelters for bad behavior. So this is the guy that we're dealing with here. Now let's get back to February 1997. On the 3rd, Marvin was released from the same jail where his victim was still locked up. On the 12th, he was seen working on a car with Wayne Davis. Remember, Wayne is the friend of the Timmerman family that was with Rachel the night she was raped. He was scheduled to testify against Marvin at his upcoming trial. The next day, February 13th, a friend of Wayne's arrived at his home to drive him to the county jail, the same county jail where Rachel was still locked up. He'd been convicted of a DUI, and he had arranged to turn himself in to serve a 90-day sentence, but when his friend arrived to get him, Wayne wasn't home. 
he was gone, his stereo equipment was gone, and there was a note on the door in his handwriting saying that he'd fled to California to avoid going to jail. Wayne was reported missing, but again, police didn't take the disappearance, disappearance? Police didn't take the disappearance or the disappearance of a disabled alcoholic drifter facing three months in jail too seriously. Not because they shouldn't, but again, because they just didn't. Soon after Wayne Davis disappeared, Marvin Gabriel was spotted at a pawn shop trying to sell a stereo system with the serial numbers scratched off. While Rachel was in jail, baby Shannon stayed with her paternal grandparents, who loved and doted on her and called her Shannon Doll. Rachel made arrangements to move in with her father and stepmother when she was released so that she could care for Shannon in a more stable environment. She was released from jail on May 5th, 1997, and promptly moved in with her dad, Tim, and her stepmom, Lynn. She wanted the transition to be smooth for Shannon who was only 11 months old, so Rachel had been in jail for nearly half of her baby daughter's life. So Shannon remained with the Verhaegs, her other grandparents, primarily, and had visits with their mom. The visits were progressively longer and closer together, leading to the Verhaegs dropping Shannon off to Rachel on Saturday, May 31st, with a plan to pick her back up on Wednesday, June 4th. Everyone was excited about little Shannon's upcoming first birthday, which was just over a week away. What they weren't excited about was Marvin Gabriel's rape trial, which was scheduled to begin on June 5th, a month to the day after Rachel was released from jail. On June 3rd, two days before the start of the trial, Rachel told her dad she had a date. Since getting out of jail, she'd been talking to a guy she met at work, 20-year-old John Weeks, and he'd asked her to dinner. He even suggested that she bring baby Shannon with her so that she didn't have to bother finding a sitter. She grabbed her purse and Shannon's diaper bag and told her dad she'd be back in a couple hours. He didn't hear from her for two days, when a letter in Rachel's handwriting arrived in the mail. It said, Dad, I'm sorry I left without saying goodbye. That guy who picked me up is like the man of my dreams. Shannon bonded with him so well, and so did I. Right now we're on vacation. Maybe we might get eloped. He already asked me to marry him. I'll be gone for a couple of weeks. I would call you on the phone, but I think you'd try to talk me out of it. Marriage. I'll write you more letters and send you my address when I get one. Love, Rachel. The letter arrived on June 5th, the day the trial was supposed to begin. It seemed odd, but Rachel had been through a lot. She was dreading the trial. She wasn't exactly known for making the best decisions, and she was young. She was only 19. Not to mention, the letter was in her handwriting, so she definitely wrote it. Uh, So her dad took it at face value, but he wasn't the only one who got a letter. The Nuevo County Prosecutor's Office got a letter a week later. Their letter said, I am writing you in hopes that you won't press charges on me for falsifying a police report. Marvin Gabrion did not rate me. I was mad at him because he called my mother and sister prostitutes at a card party. A short time later, we made up. Then we went down by the river where I performed oral sex on him. When he wouldn't have intercourse with me, I decided to teach him a lesson. The final straw was when his puppy bit me on the nose. And I'm not going to read this next sentence here because it's really graphic. I'm sorry. And the letter goes on. It says, Then I pinched myself so I'd be bruised. I am madly in love with an honest Christian man, and I can't bear the thought of trying to lock up an innocent man. Thank you, Rachel Timmerman. That same day, Rachel's father got a second letter that said she'd moved to Arkansas with her mysterious fiancé and wasn't sure when she'd be back home, but that she and Shannon were safe and happy. There were only three witnesses scheduled to testify in Marvin Gabriel's trial. Wayne Davis, who'd taken off to California, Rachel Timmerman, who was apparently now living in Arkansas, and Mikey Gabrion, the suspect's own nephew. Between the lack of witnesses and Rachel's weird confession letter, officials had no choice but to drop the charges. And as soon as they did, Marvin Gabrion disappeared. Oxford Lake is a remote body of water in the Manistee National Forest. It's not particularly deep, only about two feet, but beneath the water are 82 feet of muddy, sloshy muck. There is essentially zero visibility. When something is lost in Oxford Lake, it's lost forever. 
until it's not. On July 5, 1997, just over a month after 19-year-old Rachel Timmerman and 11-month-old Shannon Verhaeg disappeared, two fishermen at Oxford Lake spotted what they at first thought was a mannequin floating in the water. Spoiler alert, it wasn't a mannequin. It never is. What they found was like something out of a horror movie. Floating face up, her body wrapped in chains, fastened with padlocks, and weighted down by cinder blocks, her hands handcuffed behind her back, and her head and face bound with duct tape, was the body of a young woman with blonde hair. It was Rachel Timmerman. A coroner later determined that the cause of death was drowning. Rachel had been thrown into the water alive. And while it may seem like a good idea to get rid of a body by taking it deep into the woods and tossing it into a remote body of water, it's not a good idea at all if that land is part of a national park, you fucking cheese bag. Through their investigation, police were able to put together a timeline. On June 4th, the day after Rachel's date, Multiple witnesses spotted Marvin Gabrion driving an old pickup with a boat loaded into the bed of the truck. In the cab with him were two people, a young man and a young blonde woman seated between them. Witnesses identified the woman as Rachel Timmerman and the young man as John Weeks, the man who'd picked Rachel and Shannon up from Rachel's dad's house the night before. Some witnesses claimed that the man driving the truck, identified as Marvin Gabrion, of course, appeared to be angry. On June 5th, campers at Oxford Lake saw Marvin Gabrion and John Weeks standing over a roaring fire near the lake, both wearing gloves despite the unbearably hot weather. On June 6th, Marvin Gabrion's neighbors awoke in the middle of the night to the sound of him dragging his metal boat up the driveway. They watched as he unloaded life jackets, metal chains, and concrete blocks, then took a metal file to the boat's serial number. The next day, Stripped bare and serial number free, the boat was in Marvin's front yard with a for sale sign on it. Police searched Marvin's home as well as his campsite at Oxford Lake. They found the keys for the padlocks attached to the chains wrapped around Rachel's body, concrete blocks covered with paint and tar that matched the concrete blocks found tied to Rachel, a woman's hair clip, baby bottle nipples, duct tape, and bolt cutters, among other things but there was still no sign of baby Shannon or Marvin Gabrion. Among those other things found was evidence that Marvin had been receiving social security checks that belonged to a man by the name of Robert Allen. Robert Allen was well known among the Grand Rapids homeless community. He was a regular at the shelters there. The 53-year-old was last seen in 1995, right around the time authorities believe he crossed paths with Marvin Gabrion, likely at a shelter. The FBI was already involved on account of Rachel's body being found in a national forest, which is federally owned land, so they started looking into the whole social security thing. They found that between 1995 and 1997, Marvin Gabrion had cashed over $14,000 in social security checks made out to Robert Allen. The most recent checks had been cashed in New York, where Robert Allen, or someone claiming to be Robert Allen, had a P.O. box. So, on payday, FBI agents staked out the post office in Sherman, New York, where they apprehended Marvin Gabrion on October 14, 1997, when he arrived to get Robert Allen's Social Security check. When he was arrested, Marvin was carrying a Virginia's... A Virginia's? (laughs) No. When he was arrested, Marvin Gabrion was carrying a Virginia driver's license. But don't worry, that guy wasn't a murder victim, he was just a victim of identity theft. Gabrion was extradited back to Michigan, where he was convicted of social security fraud and sentenced to five years in prison, leaving officials plenty of time to build a murder case. But what about that fucking fuck, John Weeks, who went and picked Rachel and her baby up from their home and knowingly drove them to their doom? As it turns out, he was last seen alive about three weeks after his date with Rachel. He told his girlfriend that he and Gabrion were driving to Texas to pick up a drug shipment. She never saw or heard from him again. Weeks later, when she spotted Gabrion back in the area, she confronted him. He told her that he'd parted ways with Weeks in Texas when Weeks decided to travel to Arizona to stay with friends. Now, it's possible that he just took off. 
he was the co-conspirator in Rachel's murder, but given the way that people were always disappearing around Marvin Gabriel, I fucking doubt it. On June 3rd, 1999, Marvin Charles Gabriel II was charged with first-degree murder for the death of Rachel Timmerman and ordered to stand trial in federal court because the crime occurred on federally owned land. The trial began in Grand Rapids on February 25, 2002, and it was wild. Gabriel was combative and disruptive from the opening statement all the way through the sentencing hearing. When he cold-cocked his own attorney for not objecting enough, just punched him right in the face. He claimed that he was a CIA agent, he most definitely was not, and that he trained with special forces, which was another big nope. He accused members of Rachel's own family of her murder and called all of the defense witnesses pedophiles. But the jury saw right through his antics and on March 5th, 2002, they convicted him of first degree murder. That was the easy part. The sentencing phase was a bit more tricky. Michigan does not have the death penalty. Michigan has never had the death penalty. It was abolished before Michigan even became a state and was officially outlawed in 1846. The last Michigan-led execution was the hanging of a wife-murdering piece of shit in Detroit in 1830. Only once since then, in 1938, was a prisoner legally put to death in the Mitten State. Anthony Chevatoris was a career criminal that murdered an innocent bystander during a botched bank robbery in Midland. Bank robbery is a federal crime, and since the murder was committed during a bank robbery, it was considered capital murder. Not since Chevatoris swung from the gallows in Midland had a Michigan prisoner been sentenced to death. Our harshest penalty is typically life without parole. Except... Rachel Timmerman was alive when Marvin Gabriel threw her into the water. She died in Oxford Lake, which is part of the Manistee National Forest, which is federally owned land, which made her murder a federal fucking offense. So Marvin Gabriel was sentenced to death and is the only Michigan prisoner on death row. And I should mention here, Rachel's body was found 227 feet from the forest's property line, just 90 steps from private property. 90 steps. That's all that stood between a death sentence and a life sentence. Gabrion was sentenced on March 16, 2002, and it was understood that he would have years of appeals ahead of him before he'd actually be put to death. And then in 2003 federal executions were halted for 17 years. Meanwhile, close to 60 federal prisoners languished on death row unsure of their fates. Most of them, like 66-year-old Marvin Gabriel, are being held in Terre Haute, Indiana. Just last month, July 2020, federal executions started up again following a new directive from the Attorney General, and three prisoners have already been put to death. When it will be Marvin Gabriel's turn is anyone's guess. Now, I know the death penalty is a controversial topic, and you guys know that I dodge political issues on this podcast like the floor is lava, but I opened this can of worms, so I'm going to see it through. I'm not opposed to the death penalty as a concept. My issue lies in the fact that our justice system is so fucked up, there are definitely innocent people on death row, and if there's even a chance that someone's not guilty— like even a tiny little baby chance, the death penalty should be off the table. But Marvin Gabriel is guilty as fuck. In fact, the basis of one of his appeals was that Rachel was already dead when he threw her in the lake, so the murder didn't take place on federally owned land. So in his case, I believe the death penalty is a thousand percent warranted. I will feel zero sympathy or empathy if and when it happens, And honestly, like, where's the firing squad? He does not deserve the piece of a lethal injection. And don't forget, he was only convicted of the murder of Rachel Timmerman, but she wasn't the only body in his backyard. His accomplice in the murder, John Weeks, is still missing. 
The man whose social security he stole for years, Robert Allen, is still missing. Wayne Davis, the witness in the rape case? Oh, they found him exactly five years to the day after the body of Rachel Timmerman was found. Canoeists found Wayne's body at Twinwood Lake, which is also in the Manistee National Forest. Like Rachel, Wayne was chained to cinder blocks, bound, and tossed into the lake alive. And what about baby Shannon? Her body has never been found, despite exhaustive search attempts over the years in very unsearchable water. One theory is that Marvin Gabrion sold her on the black market, but that's likely just wishful thinking. Most authorities believe that Shannon was killed along with her mother and that her body is unrecoverable. Gabrion himself told fellow inmates that he killed the baby because he didn't know what to do with her. If she's still alive, no matter how slim that chance might be, she would be 24 years old today, and age progression photos are still done regularly for her. I will post the most recent one on the So Dead website. And that is the story of Michigan's only death row inmate, Marvin Charles Gabrion II. Thank you for coming to my dead talk. Some of my sources for this episode were the book The Color of Night by L.C. Timmerman and John H. Timmerman. L.C. Timmerman is actually Rachel's father, and John is his brother, so the book was actually written by Rachel's dad and her uncle. It is a heartbreaking book. I read the whole thing in a day. It reads like a novel more than a true crime book, so some of the facts were tricky because some of the dates mentioned didn't match up with dates that are known parts of the timeline and some of the names were changed and it was hard to know which ones in some cases but that personal experience and the things that you just can't get if you're not hearing it from someone who experienced it it's just it's a really good book. I definitely recommend that you read it. It's available on Amazon. Uh, that's where I got it. I'm sure it's available other places as well. Uh, but it's The Color of Night by L.C. Timmerman and John H. Timmerman. I also listened to a couple of podcasts that have already covered the case. My girl Nina over at Already Gone covered this case on episode 84. And then I listened to a podcast that's pretty new. It's called Beyond Contempt and episode 22 was on Rachel Timmerman. I hadn't heard of this podcast. I found it specifically looking for information on Rachel's case. It is so good. Renee, I think is the host name. Renee, good fucking job. Love it. Excellent research. Good voice. Love the accent. I can't place it. It's a little Michigan-y, but not. Maybe like Minnesota-ish. I don't know. I don't know. But I love it. So check that podcast out, Beyond Contempt. And um, there were others, you know, of course, Wikipedia, Find a Grave, newspapers.com, lots of online articles. You can find my full list of sources for this episode on the So Dead website. <sighs> All right. Now that we've gotten business out of the way, let's talk. So I took the summer off. Sorry to leave you guys in a lurch. Uh, I did so to work on some projects and I got exactly zero work done on the projects that I was planning to work on. Part of that is, you know, I just, I needed a break. I did a lot of sleeping, but I also took on a whole new project that I wasn't planning on that wasn't even a thing that existed in my head when I decided to take a break. And that was the first So Dead miniseries, The Serial Killer Chronicles. It is all about Battle Creek and the Kellogg's and their sanitarium and murders connected to the Kellogg's, and it was such a cool project to work on. It's eight episodes long. It's finished. The last episode came out last week, so the entire series is ready to binge. The episodes are about 20 to 30 minutes apiece, so not too terribly long, and yeah, that was a lot of fun to do. As you guys know, I love cereal, and I love true crime, so to be able to put the two things together and still keep it all Michigan-related, <coughs> tops. You're the taps, corn pops. Yeah, so I also, <laughs> I had these really cheesy sign-offs every episode. I had a different one that was related to cereal, and that was one of them. You're the taps, corn pops. Sorry, just, you know, that's me. I love a good pun. So those projects that I was working on, still working on them. 
One is a writing project. I call it that now, but it's most likely going to be a book. I mean, what else would it be? I guess it could be a blog, a magazine, an expose. Um, but yeah, no, it's another book and it's true crime related and Michigan related. And I'm really excited about it. I'm about a quarter of the way done with my first draft. I was hoping to get it done this summer, but Dr. Kellogg and his sanitarium took up way too much of my time. Um, I've also got a video project that I am working on. I don't know if I'm going to be on camera. It's generally not something I enjoy. And also, you know, we're all putting on that pandemic weight, and I didn't really need to put on any more weight as it was. So not sure if I'm going to pop my face up in that. But the video is going to involve the case of Matthew Macon, Lansing's serial killer. Uh, back when I was working on that episode last December, I submitted a FOIA request to the Lansing Police Department for his confession tapes, and I just got them. Um, obviously, the pandemic put a delay on everything. Yeah. Whatever the case, I don't know. It was my first. It was my first FOIA request, so I don't know how long to expect those to take. But it took a long time. I just got the tapes, and now that I've got them, I'm going to do something with them. I don't know what yet, but something. Um, the Festival of Oddities is a month away, just over a month away. Oh God, I'm going to have a panic attack right here while I'm recording. Um, so of course. Public events, very tricky. I've canceled all of the Demented Mitten tours for this year. Um, most of my public appearances have been canceled. No So Dead live shows planned. But the festival is something that I felt very strongly that I needed to try to still do because it, it supports local artists and small businesses. So we kind of retooled things, scaled it all back so that it's more than anything kind of like a a creepy flea market or like a macabre farmer's market. Basically, all of those hands-on activities and special guests and speakers, we canceled all of that and it's just going to be a socially distanced, safe, sanitary way to shop at different local vendors. So I hope that you guys will come check it out. It's September 5th from 11 to 7 at the Courthouse Square Museum in Charlotte, Michigan. And yes, I'm panicking about it. I still don't really leave my house a lot, so this is a big, big thing for me to do. But I think it's important, and I think that we can pull it off. What else? What else? Oh, yeah. So another thing that happened while I was on break was I was contacted by a major network, about taking part in a special that they're doing on one of the cases that I've covered. I can't tell you what network and I can't tell you what case yet. And that's not because I'm purposely being coy. It's because I'm literally not allowed to tell you. Uh, all I can tell you is that last I heard it was supposed to air in October sometime. And as soon as I'm given permission to share the information with you guys, I will. But it's, uh, oh, it was so crazy. I'm, I'm not convinced that my footage won't wind up on the cutting room floor. It, it very well might. But the fact that it happened at all, that I was contacted at all by this network is crazy to me. Um, filming took place about a month ago, maybe. It was a long day. It was about seven hours. Um, we were not in my living room. My podcast studio is not as amazing as the setup that we had uh, that I was filmed in, all for the, all for the love of TV. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it, and I will tell you guys about that as soon as I can. <sighs> I think that's it. Um, right now, episodes are back every other week. Uh, now through November, I'll take another break in December, and then season three will start in January. I'm going to take a break from the taco breaks for a while. I love doing them. They're a lot of fun. They're a lot easier, obviously, than a full episode. But I really am still trying to get this book underway and this video project underway. And so I just I want to leave myself a little bit of time while not leaving you guys hanging, waiting for more episodes. So 
Uh, Taco Breaks will be back maybe with season three, but I'm going to take a break for a little bit. Um, I want to, now I know normally thank yous and shout outs on air are reserved for the people that have left reviews of So Dead on either Apple Podcasts or Facebook. But today I want to just send a huge, huge thank you to my patrons. Uh, You guys have continued to support me even when I was on hiatus. No matter what I'm going through, you guys continue to, you know, provide that financial support. And it's really emotional support as well because I know that you guys are out there, you're waiting, you're willing to invest in the podcast and help me keep it going financially. And that's just incredible to me. So I want to say thank you to Jean, Danielle Barrett, Nicole Johnson, Amy Skykey, Colin Anzacek, Susie Wyke, Amanda Moorer, Shelly Gonzalez, Melissa Selleck, Holly Wheeler, Tracy, Laura Carl, Jennifer Hull, Tara Burninghand, Taylor Suzanne, Heather Hunsicker, Amber Santana, Luann Hun, Steph B, Sarah C, Bonnie Thurston, Cindy Wright, Monica Kehoe. Monica, I'm sorry I talk so much shit about your last name. I believe you to be a lovely human being. Um, Tina Ziegler, Alicia Ryle, Amy Lavert, Melissa Doss, Denise Thomas, Jacob Bernard, Esper Aqua, Cy Wilson, Diana Chambers, Shelby Morley, Margaret Helwig, not Helwig, not Head, not Hedwig either. Margaret Helwig, Darla Thomas, Misty DC, Tracy Luce, Sarah Cardinal, Gay Mullen Brown, Sammy Joe Marsh, Mandy Westfall, Stephanie Bellflower, Eric Britton, Andrea Bazaire, Haley Sellers, Sue Lewis, Heather Lafave, Nikki Whitney, and Tammy. And I'm so sorry if I screwed up any of those names, you guys. But thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you all. And now let's talk about life. It's been a while, right? A few months. Uh, I left you guys kind of a couple months into quarantine. And now we're a couple years into quarantine. <laughs> Just kidding. It feels like it though. Uh, I am still working from home. My husband's working from home. My oldest son is not working right now. The The program that he was supposed to start is on indefinite hiatus until it's safe. And my youngest son, who is about to start his senior year, will be doing so from home. His entire district is going to be home until at least December. Um, but he likely will just finish out the year that way. It's it's his last year. He's not a big fan of the whole school structure Um everyday in-person thing anyways so he'll probably just just finish it up online um so yeah we're all in the house together all day every day me and three boys and two dogs who are loving having their whole family home I got chickens if you guys remember (laughs) right before I went on hiatus I got baby chicks and they are not babies anymore they are humongous and they live outside now they're in a pen Uh, hopefully eggs will be coming soon which was the whole point they're fun though I have fun with them my kids hate them they say they look like creepy little dinosaurs which I guess they kind of do but I love them my kids hate them um I doubled down on the at-home farm, and I recently got two baby bunnies. I named them Bunny and Clyde, naturally. They're fucking adorable. They're little flappy-eared, speckled, fat little toasted marshmallows, and I love them. Um, Aside from that and working on my projects, I just been watching a lot of TV. I, um, I've shied away quite a bit, actually, from true crime. I used to watch the ID channel morning, noon, and night. I don't really watch that a whole lot anymore. Uh, when the pandemic first started, I started watching the show New Girl, which I had never seen because I wanted to watch something light and funny and 
yeah, I loved it. Hilarious. Went through that pretty quickly. Since then, let's see, I made a list for you guys so I could give you my, my recommendations. Um, Downton Abbey. I finally watched Downton Abbey. It's not Downtown Abbey, despite what people that have never seen it think, including me until a couple months ago. It is Downton Abbey. And I fucking love that show so much. It, it's a period piece. It starts with the sinking of the Titanic, which you know is my jam. What more do you want? Loved it. Um, Yellowstone, the Kevin Costner show on I, the Paramount Network. I don't even know what that is. Uh, I wanted to watch that when it came out. I didn't have the channel it was on, but it's on the new Peacock streaming service now and amazing I love it so much it's basically like Sons of Anarchy with cowboys and Sons of Anarchy is my favorite show of all time so it is totally for me the show Hollywood on Netflix it's new there's only one season it just came out I think kind of right around the beginning of the year maybe or even after the pandemic started I'm not sure but I loved it it was not what I was expecting at all, but it was a really good show. I watched Godless, which was a mini series from a couple years ago. It has one of my favorite actresses, Merritt Weaver, um, and then Lady Mary Crawley playing a cowgirl. So what I mean, what else what else do you want? Um, Outer Banks, which just came out the first season. Just a good little like teenage soap opera. 90210 vibes type thing. Um, loved that. I did watch Waco and I liked it a lot. You know, I was obviously alive when Waco happened because I'm old as shit. And what I watched and how I remembered it being reported at the time were two very, very different things. It was very eye opening. Uh, Tiger King, of course, goes without saying. <laughs> But if any of you haven't watched it, it's definitely worth a watch. Uh, and then there were shows that I had kind of started before the pandemic that I finished up as it was going on and just highly, highly recommend uh, Schitt's Creek, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and the show Little Fires Everywhere, which was um, a mini series. I think because it was so successful, they're talking about doing a season two, but it was a miniseries on Hulu with Reese Witherspoon and Carrie Washington, and it was phenomenal. Um, and then, of course, the new seasons of Dead to Me, Dirty John the Bedry Broder Bedry? <laughs> Dirty John the Betty Broderick story. I just finished that up. Um, I know the new Unsolved Mysteries came out. I only watched the first episode. I'm going to get back to it at some point. Like I said, just kind of limiting my true crime a little bit. I think the next thing I'm going to watch is going to be I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which is the HBO special about the Golden State Killer and Michelle McNamara, uh, our buddy Billy Jensen, my queen Karen Kilgariff, lots of people that I really look up to are featured in the documentary. And I haven't watched it yet. It just ended. I wanted to binge it all over a day or a couple days, so I've been waiting. So I'm going to watch that probably pretty soon here. And those are my, those are my TV recommendations if you guys are looking for stuff to binge because, yeah, what the fuck else is there to do? Anyway, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Surprise! I hope you're excited to have another episode of New Bed. And... Did I say New Bed? Oh my god. Anyways, thank you guys so much for joining me today surprise I hope you're excited that so dead is back sorry for the lack of fanfare like I said it was a last minute decision to put a new episode out today so please remember to rate review and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen you can find me on Facebook Instagram Twitter Pinterest and YouTube at so dead podcast please check out the patreon page for ways to support the show financially you can find that at patreon.com forward slash so dead podcast. Lots of bonus episodes available, um, monthly giveaways done, early access to episodes now that episodes are back and rolling. So lots of lots of fun stuff there. 
And be sure to visit SoDeadPodcast.com for all of your so Dead merch. As always, you can email me your feedback and story ideas to SoDeadPodcast at gmail.com. A new episode is coming your way in a couple of weeks. Until then, keep shining, you magnificent what the fucks.